Welcome, 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 everybody. I'm Matt Bellis, and this is the third in five installments of our parenting series with the Mercer County Tech School parents. Thank you so much for watching this. I don't know if we'll have any uh, parents joining us for this call. We had a little time change because we have a very special guest, a very busy guest, and we wanted to accommodate George Scott, who's a marriage and family therapist here in Mercer County, and he has a lot of knowledge of Mercer County and, and the schools in it. Um, and I'm just delighted to have him here as an expert to, uh, to share with you his knowledge and to have a conversation about, about parenting and our kids. And let me uh, make you a host here, George, so you can go ahead and, and do your thing. So welcome, George. Great. Great, thanks, Matt. Thank you so much for both the invitation and a really, really nice introduction. So good afternoon, folks. Um, you know, if um, you get a chance, you're going to grab this because you're going to watch the video of this or you're going to see it live now. Um, families are busy and we're coming off from really difficult times. So what I'm hoping to do is um, just to give you some overall insight on, on um, how this issue of raising healthy kids and homes for healthy kids, how that works. Um, there is no intent here to make anybody feel bad. But if you kind of take a look at that and say, wow, he's talking about my family or my home you're gonna hear me refer to it as my nest, then it gives you an opportunity in the privacy of your own family to make some adjustments and, and tweak some changes. So we're all about helping and supporting moms and dads who create healthy environments so kids do better, both in school and just in general. So let me begin here by going to nature. Um, I'm having a slide problem now. Maybe because we shifted back. I'm gonna just get out and back in, would that be okay? Okay, sure. Yeah, there I see you moving the, the cursor there. So we... yeah, let me let me go back in. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, Matt and I just had to do a little bit of technical change. Of course, we can always uh, start over again if we have to, George. It's, uh, yeah, if we, if we had to do that, but maybe that. maybe we will not. Is it not letting um, you share your screen? It wasn't allowing me to move my slides, which was, hmm. which was real. Here we go. Well, let's try it again. We'll overlay it. And All then right. we'll do this. I think we'll be fine. What I like about um, things not going smoothly is that parents realize that we screw up too. So, <laughs> Oh, you, you would like this, George. I gave an invite to a school system with 1,200 staff. And I sent them the invite, and then I sent the panelists' invites to my client and a few other people. And I said, please don't share these with anyone else. And sure enough, on the day of the program, I had 1,200 panelists <laughs> <'cause> they, <laughs> with everyone. I was like, oh, you know, the first minute I log in. So, uh, and you know what? Everything's fine. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is a, certainly a serious conversation, but it doesn't mean that we have to be so serious that we lose our sense of humor, Right. Or, or that, that we don't take a breath and kind of say, okay, screw that up, but let's see how I can do it better. And that's really what this is about in terms of this issue called parenting. So I'm gonna go back into nature. I wanna go back into nature and I'm gonna start the story with this, right? So here we have some, they're called chicks. They're emperor penguin chicks. And you, know, you don't have to know a lot about penguins except to know they live in pretty hostile environments. And therefore they are, biologically prepared to survive. However, sometimes a storm comes. And when the storm comes, the adults show up. So you can see in this slide that the chicks are vulnerable. There they are. Storm is coming. The adults feel it. The adults show up. And then in the midst of the storm, well, what happened to the chicks? Mm -hmm. Well, the chicks are embedded in the middle of that group because those big penguins can survive 40 below zero, but their, pen, but their chicks cannot. Elder penguins cannot. So here's a really interesting thing about penguins. They huddle up and huddle up and huddle up. And in the midst of that are the infirm, the elderly, the chicks to keep them warm. Now, as the outside penguins get cold, you'll watch the circle change. Cold penguins go inside, warm penguins come outside, and they keep rotating through the storm because the goal is we all have to survive. We all have to take care of one another. And we really need to create environments that are healthy for our babies. That's a profound lesson out of 
out of nature. But let's see what happens. So how does this become this? Boy, don't we wish we could feel this more. But for some of us, this is kind of where it turns. And therefore, what you can see here is the babies, the chicks, are not protected by the adults at all. So remember, the, the, the penguin adults protect their babies from the storm. That's the goal. But sometimes human adults are the storm. They create the environment inside the family, in their interactions, in the environment that gets created. Well, George, could you, could you talk a little bit more what that looks like? I can, and I want to, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but let me give you the sense of the science on this. It's called ACEs. It's the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And what it says is, and this is a, this is a really important concept, it's called exposure. When our babies, beginning in utero, and from birth, we'll take it to 18, when our babies are exposed to harshness, without protection, when they feel they're in it alone, what it does is it interferes with their lives in the following ways. For instance, kids do less well in school. They argue, are more disrespectful, and they fight more. It's a survival skill. They isolate. They begin to use drugs and alcohol. Things that are the opposite of what you want for your babies, our babies have a tendency to get to only because they grew up in a nest with a storm that got created by the adults. Storms can look different. It's not a particular age group or particular culture or particular ethnicity or particular socioeconomic level. Don't think that there are variables so unique that only certain families are exposed to these storms. Not true. But if you take a look at it, you can see that. Take a look at all of the children in these slides. They want it to stop. They're afraid, they're, they're, they're trying to hide, they're scared. And when our babies live with that on a regular basis, you would never know this, but I'm gonna tell you what the science is telling us. The brains begin to rewire differently. They begin to wire in a way that makes kids hypersensitive and hypervigilant for danger and fear, and kids operate out of that mode, even in school, even at home. So storms, human storms can look different. So what we wanna do is we wanna create healthy nests for our kids. How do you know if you're creating a storm in the family for your children? Let's take a look at that ACEs. What you're gonna see are 10 categories. The categories are descriptors of things that can happen inside of families. If in fact you can say, yep, my family, no, that's not me, yep, that's my family, add up the numbers of these categories and you'll begin to get something that we refer to as an ACEs score. And the more of those we have, the harsher the outcomes for our babies. So here's the slide around ACEs. So if you go all the way to the left, now, let me acknowledge this. These are really uncomfortable topics and they're filled with shame and embarrassment and they're filled with stigma. So therefore, if it is going on in a family, it's very hard for a family to acknowledge that because they have a knowing that they wish things could be better. Not looking to embarrass anybody, not looking to create stigma around anybody, looking for you to do in the privacy of your own home a rather private personal assessment of the family's ACEs score and maybe your own ACEs score because here's an interesting phenomenon. I'm going to use the word legacy. Kids who have a high ACEs score, they've inherited it. It's the legacy of a mom or dad or both that have a high ACEs score. If a mom or a dad have a high ACEs score, it's the legacy that they've inherited from their mom and dad. And what we're trying to do and what we're working hard to do is break the cycle. When we're aware of how our own behavior interferes, we can change our behavior, our kids are healthier. Physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. You can see the embarrassment, shame, and stigma. 
physical and emotional neglect. Kids not getting the good stuff that they need to nurture the body, to nurture the brain. And then the five on this side are very, very interesting because they are behavioral. There are things that are in the environment at home that kids get exposed to. For instance, somebody in the family has a mental illness, diagnosed or undiagnosed, that creates tension or disruption in the house. At the nest, the kids observe mom being treated violently, physically, emotionally. When you bear witness to somebody else's hurt, it creates hurt inside of you. If there's been a divorce inside the family, now that's a little tricky and here's why. We've evolved to believe that, all right, so what's the big deal? It's a divorce, 52% of married couples get a divorce. Well, the numbers are accurate, but it's devastating for some kids, particularly if that divorce is not managed well. So divorce is a significant disruptor. Living in a family where somebody was incarcerated and all that comes with that and substance abuse, alcohol or drugs, street drugs or script drugs, 10 things that in any combination inside of a family has a negative effect on our children. And as a result of that, their relationships, their school performance, their emotional and physical wellness is jeopardized. See, as adults, we have to be responsible and build safety nets for our kids. We love our kids. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are that you have these kids. So, you know, let's think about it. Some of them are, are natural to you, or maybe they're adopted kids, or maybe they're stepchildren, or maybe they're foster kids. But in our, in our lives, we love these babies, and we have to be responsible for their well-being. So let's continue a conversation and talk about how to create a healthy nest. Back to you, Matt. Thank you so much. I mean, I was uh, really in, engaged in, in what you presented and, and just had some thoughts, um, you know, uh, about the analogy of, of, of how animals protect their young. And, um, you know, I, I think so many times problems start in families where parents forget that goal, right? They get their anger takes over their frontal lobe, and they're just sort of reacting. Um, and maybe they're not even aware of why they're so angry about something. They could be reenacting something that they lived through in their exactly. childhood, right? And exactly. I'm just curious how often you, you see people like this um, in your practice where you kind of have to break down why it is they're reacting so harshly and so quickly to the slightest little disrespect or, you know, a kid ignoring a parent and they forget yeah, about it. Yeah, you know, the reason that's a, an insightful question is because one of the things that, that I've noticed, at least in my practice, if, I, if the phone rings and there's a mom, usually a mom on the phone referring, and, and, and the, the conversation usually goes like this. Hey, listen, Mr. Scott, I'm really worried about my son. There's something wrong going in there. Can I make an appointment for him? Can I make an appointment for her? And what I say is, of course, absolutely. But what I would like when we were in person, the whole family comes in. Now that we're virtual, everybody's on camera. I like to see everybody. And then there's a silence. And the mom will say, let me make myself clear. My, my kid is smoking weed or my kid's grades are falling apart. He's becoming more disrespectful. I said, gee, I, I understand. And, you know, and, and I feel that it's really disruptive, but I'd like to see the whole family. So we go to step two, right? Just to see the whole family. Now that, that adolescent doesn't want to come to a therapist's office. There's no way. So either they threaten the kid or they bribe the kid or something to get them come. And they'll come into the room and they'll sit with their arms crossed and they're, I'm not talking. And I say to them, but I'm not expecting you to talk. You have to talk at all. What I'd like you to do, however, is to listen. Because I think there are some interesting things you'll hear that might be helpful. And I start with this. I say, you know, Johnny, I don't know anything about your mom and dad or you or your siblings, nothing at all. But I can tell you this. I don't think you're the problem. Now, right away, that kid is looking at me like, wait a minute. I've been told I'm the problem for months now, for years now. I said, yeah, I don't think so. Then I said to him, hey, do you know what a barometer is? And he said, well, I think so. I said, well, a barometer is just this little device that tells us what the weather's like. 
I said, you know what? You're the barometer in your family. I only need to know your struggles to know that there's stuff going on inside your family. Now I turn and look at mom and dad and they're looking like, oh man, we thought we were coming for him. Now we got to look at our own stuff because it is our stuff that affects our babies. And once they realize like, oh, I didn't realize that it was because we do this or we said this and we change that behavior. Actually, that kid gets closer because they want to be connected and we're often running to heal it. Hmm. You know, the, the group I worked with for five years at Navy SEALs and their families, I, I worked with Navy SEAL Foundation doing a lot of post-deployment conferences and I have no military experience. So for me, it was very uh, intimidating at first, but what I'm fascinated sure. me. Yeah, what was so interesting was, you know, my assumption is, of course, these guys are superheroes and why am I here? But you come to find out that, you know, as a parent, you know, a Navy SEAL who was off to war where seconds count, it's life or death. And then all of a sudden they come home and now, you know, their toddler won't get in the child's seat of the car and they're exploded because it's like t- seconds matter, right? It's life or death. And so the, the ability to at least compartmentalize some trauma they'd experienced at war and not bring that into their family life was hard. That was a big part of the discussion of how do you, you know, intervene there. So I'm, I'm curious um, when you find that parents are doing this and they love their kids, right? And they, they want to be the protector, especially the Navy SEALs. I mean, they were all about protecting, but yet Absolutely. when they get triggered, it's like, boom, they're a different human being and now they're the aggressor. And I'm curious, like, how do you intervene there? Well, the interesting thing about that, let me take you back to ACEs because, you know, I work on a soft assumption, nothing hard, nothing definite, a soft assumption that an angry dad or a distant mom, there's a reason for that, right? And usually that's their own ACEs score. Usually that's what what they've experienced or how much they've had to work hard to survive and they don't have a tenderness or a softness or a connectedness. Well, now neither does their child. So the intervention then is to make them feel like they're not bad people. Actually, there's nothing wrong with them. It's not their fault. It's what happened to them. When we get conversations going, they begin to smile more. They relax more. They share more. And they begin to do the deep power of the, it's really a, it's really a powerful, moms and dads have a powerful amount of influence. And they begin to feel proud of being a mom and dad and know that they can create safe and healthy environments with kids. So we build relationships and we ask them, well, what do you need to feel safer? Or what do you need to be less angry? And we begin, people, you'll hear from the moms and dads, like they'll turn to each other and say, I didn't know you felt that way. They've been married for 20 years or 15 years, but they didn't know they felt that way. Because in our homes, our busy lives, we don't have these kinds of conversations. Hmm. That's profound. You told me a quote before we started recording that I thought, was perfect for this too. I don't know if you want to share it now or are you going to? Yeah, I can share it now because it was profound for me too. It came across my desk just a week ago. And the quote goes something like this. When you criticize your children, they will not stop loving you. They will stop loving themselves. That's what happens with criticism all the time. Listen, I'm in favor of discipline but I'm not in favor of criticism and punishment, but I am in favor of discipline. There's a difference. And when we keep on our kids, when we're on their backs, did you do your homework? I can't trust you. Are you doing this? Why didn't you do that? How about a better grade? Those criticisms, they don't make the kids hate you. Kids are very loyal, but what they will do is they will accept your criticism as the truth about themselves and they will stop believing in themselves. You know, I think I saw it play out last night. In fact, uh, what I've noticed is that some parents are sort of overly involved. Um, certainly where I'm living in Princeton, you can see this. And there was a dad who was coaching on the baseball team and I'm coaching too, but he was very critical of his son, whether it was pitching or at bat and just in his ear, all practice long. And the kid was, you could see the kid was just getting angrier and angrier, but he was getting angry at himself. Like if he'd struck out, now he's throwing the helmet and he's throwing the bat and you can hear him swearing and he's upset. Um, and it's it's being driven by that, that parent just criticizing the kid. I agree. And it's so hard to watch because, you know, that kid's not developing a love for the game <laughs> if that's the drama that's playing out. 
I love that example, Matt. That's a perfect example. And there's puppy humiliation there too, right? Dad isn't being discreet. He's doing it out in public, which makes the shame even greater for that kid. Yeah, it was tough because the kid is a, he's a good athlete, right? And, and you know, you, you go to the parent and you wonder, you know, what what's driving that? You know, where where did that come from? Was his was his father the same yes. way? Do you think that's what it yes. means to be a good parent? I mean, oftentimes you hear, you know, uh, people in my generation talk about that, like, well, when we were younger, you know, yeah. they they told it like it was, and that's the way it should be. And you're like, really? I I don't remember enjoying yeah. it. Screaming at us. Where parents fall back on, oh, you think this is tough. You should see how I was treated. But it doesn't make it better. <laughs> it's not the right thing to do. That was my father's idea of empathy. You think you're the only one? Uh, it's not helping, Dad. I don't know. <laughs> right now, I was hoping I was the only one, but apparently not. <laughs> oh, man. Well, in my work, Mercer County, tech schools. I mean, there's such a wide range of students that are there and experiences. Um, and I think it is it is important to focus on both sides of the spectrum. So the parents that are neglectful and that are just not present for whatever reason, you know, whether they're working all the time or they're struggling with substance abuse problems or mental health yeah. issues. Yes. Um, and I, I always, I have a tough time when that comes up and you have a, a teenager in front of me who's saying like, look, my parents are just not in, in my life. What should I do? And they're not around. And um, I mean, how might you encourage a kid to find the penguins, the emperor penguins to surround himself with when they don't, the parent models aren't there? And, you know, that is tough because, you know, and, and I'm, I'm believing that from where, where you work with this group, it's not like you're going to make a home visit, right? Or talk to the mom and dad about that. So, this is something that, that came out of the ACES research that's really a good thing to say to kids. You say, you know, I don't know what's going on with mom and dad. They, they have their own struggles. Apparently, apparently, they're struggling a lot. I mean, you seem like a great kid. Why would they not want to pay attention to you? But you know what we also know is if you identify and find another trusted significant adult, that can be equally helpful. In fact, that's what the research says. Kids with high ACES scores, However, the outcome is good. Usually they found an adult to take them under their wing, a coach, a teacher, right? A pastor, a grandparent, an, uh, some other family member or neighbor. So sometimes what it can be is not to encourage them to go and look. You say, well, hey, listen, let me ask you, step back a little bit. I, I, I know you're feeling bad about mom and dad. What other adults do you have in your life? What do you get from them? What's it like when you see them? Wow, you know, I've got this coach that just compliments me all the time. Good for you. I'm glad you have that. Or somebody who says, you know, you're a smart kid. Like you got a good brain. Those are the people that will keep that kid's head above water. He needs it from someplace and he'll take it from wherever if, if mom and dad can't deliver. Well, thank you. And I, I see that we have uh, an attendee, Pamela Meyer, Mayor. I'm sorry, Pamela. Um, and if, if it's okay, George, maybe we can uh, promote Pamela to a panelist and see if Pamela has any questions, wants to join the conversation. And you're the host, so what you do um, is you can either... You want me to give that back to you because I'm done with my slides? Yes, sure. That would be, that would be the easiest thing to do. And uh, Okay, you've got it back now. All right. So I will promote Pamela up to a uh, panelist here and... When she joins, we'll see if there's any questions or any comments. And I so appreciate you, Pamela, for, for joining us on the call. Welcome. We had, uh, there we go. There she is. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, wow, this has been an emotional half hour holy cow like i just feel <laughs> you hit on a lot of topics that um really relate to my family um my daughter since a very young age has always had anxiety she has been through a great deal of surgeries in life um at a very young age and 
it's kind of been my nature and her father's nature. We, I don't want to say coddle her, but when you're a four-year-old baby and your appendix bursts, you, you tend to, you know, not leave your child's side. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. um, just uh, my daughter just graduated 11th grade and she uh, had prom and I didn't cry during prom. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, I thought to myself, because she's in Mercer County, Votech, she's in the STEM Academy, and she is such a brilliant young lady. And, um, you know, for 12th grade, they're actually at the college. So they're a senior in high school, but really a freshman in college at the same time. So I know that's going to be a big change for her. And I know the pandemic being the year right before that was huge. And it really, you know, when these kids were supposed to be having the time of their life and finding their place and socializing, you know, they were kind of condemned to their home for a good portion of it. So there's a lot of emotion coming from her and her friends um, because they feel like they missed out. And I've seen a large amount of uh, more anxiety because of the pandemic. And she struggled with remote. She is a really good hands-on type student. Like when, you know, she takes STEM, you're supposed to be in a STEM lab and working with machines and get your hands dirty. She had 3D printing at home. How do you do that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, and, but she finished with A's and B's. She's fantastic. She, she um, was accepted into the National Honor Society, which I couldn't be any more proud. But when you were saying like kind of, constantly nudging your child can create self worth or, or, or lower self esteem for them that really hit home for me and I didn't necessarily look at it from that angle because I would always say you know I'd go in the room and she'd be on PlayStation once in a while and I'd be like why are you playing video games you have homework to do like did you do your homework yet half hour later did you do your homework yet and from my point of view, I was trying to support her so that she should accomplish the grades or, or that she did accomplish the grades that she truly wanted to, because I, I know how successful she wants to be. I mean, th this young lady, she is going to cure cancer. Mark my word, you will hear her name again. She is lost so many family members to cancer that she has such a passion in her that that she's not giving up till she figures something out um and i what you said made me see a different side of it it made me see that you know i made her kind of feel like crap by saying all the time like i guess i did not show trust in her you know, saying that, did you do your homework yet? Did you do your homework yet? Did you do it? Um, so I appreciate that you brought that up and I welcome hearing new approaches to, to how to help her through because, you know, I wish in some ways that she had a senior year in high school, you know, so she can kind of have her last hurrah. But on the other hand, you know, She's kind of ready for college. Um, this is the reason she went to Mercer County STEM Academy is because she wanted a smaller school. She responds better in smaller crowds. Um, so yeah, that that really hit home. So thank you for that. Thank you, you're, Pamela. You're, what do you think you're welcome. Well, I, you know, you 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 shared a lot, and thank you for that. Um, I appreciate you're welcome. that. I do that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not apo don't apologize because it, it gives me a context, um, you know, to, to which that helps my thinking and making a comment back to you. There are a couple of thoughts that I had. Yes, as parents, particularly, we kind of personalize in a sad way the experience that our kids had going through COVID. No question. Right. Keep in mind, however, they are one of lots of kids in the class who went through COVID. 
it was a shared experience. Mm -hmm. So because it was, it wasn't as devastating had it been just her. Right. So right. that 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 makes that it, it, it kind of makes it a common burden, uh, including the staff. So so that's one thing to do. The other thing I was thinking of to do is, um, look, I know why parents push their kids. They want their kids to do the best. And sometimes we have to take a step back and see whether or not they can use the skills that you've taught them since they were four. Mm -hmm. Like if you're always going to micromanage and self-direct them, then they're never going to develop the independence of thinking and doing or coming to you and asking for help. See, I say to parents, when your kids hit high school, your role shifts. You no longer tell them what to dress in the morning, what to have for breakfast. You can try, but it won't work. Right. But now your role <laughs> becomes expert resource. If you need help with that, I'm over here. You can come and ask me. And then you don't pursue them. Let them come to you because then they're self-directed. Then they, they're a little bit of, they master their own destiny in doing that. And okay. it'll cut down on the anxiety and tension between you two, like rolling her eyes, mom, leave me alone. Yes, I told you. Right. Just step back and do that. Now, sometimes, and this is a parent fear, but what if my kid doesn't do well? Well, it's not fatal. Right. If they don't do well, they will learn the skills to do better. And then that's a life skill. But if you carry them over the finish line, then when they launch to college, they got no, no sense of self-direction on how they need to do it for themselves. Well, she, I remember she has gotten straight A's since like kindergarten. And I remember the first B she got and she was devastated. Like it literally mentally destroyed her. And her father and I have always promoted, we just want you to try your best. Nobody's saying in this house that you have to get straight A's or you have to get A's and B's. I mean, she, you know, when they say, are you smarter than a fifth grader? You know, she didn't get her smarts from me, <laughs> but, um, you know, we always try to encourage her. Patty, just try your best. Nobody here is going to reprimand you. Nobody like that's just not who either one of us are. Like my husband and I, we we just want her to be her. But she got it from somebody. She got, she got it, it from, from somewhere, yeah. right? Sometimes yeah. it's competition among the peer groups. Sometimes it's teachers or extended family members. So you're right to be able to say, we're not going to pressure you. And right. we feel right. really badly when you're anxious and when you're upset, when you're bothered by that B, we're just going to celebrate you. And you normalize the performance that she's giving now. Mm -hmm. Good for you. You know, as I, as I heard you talking too, I was thinking about uh, my experience. I worked in a, a traumatic brain injury unit at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And wow. we used to have a, a phrase, yeah, it was a tough patient population. And I worked a lot with outpatients as well, who often had this belief in their abilities that was far beyond where they really were. And it would get frustrating because these are adults, right? And they can do what they want to do. And so the, the phrase we used to use was planned failure. When they were really pushing back, like, no, no, I'm independent enough. I can do this. At some point, we're like, okay, all right, let's do a little experiment. And in our heads, we're thinking planned failure. This is probably not going to go very well. But as long as they're relatively safe, let's try this for a week, two weeks. Let's see where it's going to go. And then we'll check back in, right, as, as a way to do a little experiment on it to see how independent are you. And it was nice that we stopped being that nagging force of reminding right. them to do something. And why didn't you do this? Rather, we step back and sort of watch it play out. And hey, if they did great, wonderful. They exceeded expectations. If they didn't, we could talk about that. But it did shift our role. And I, yeah. I like that. And George brought that up you know, earlier is uh, give them some agency. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like the idea too, right? Number one, we apologize for being a nag. That is so powerful with kids to say, you know what? I'm really sorry. I'm taking a self account here. And what I realize is I've been on you a lot. So would this be okay? How about for a week or two? I'm not going to check your online grades. I'm not going to ask if your homework is done. I'm just going to enjoy you as my kid. And you let that run wow. because what it'll do, just like Matt said, it'll shift the relationship. Okay. Because it is likely that within the week, if there's something you can do that will be helpful, your daughter would come and say, hey, mom, can you do, can you look up, can you share? Because you've taken the pressure off to say, this is yours. You can come to me if you need to, but I'm not going to self-direct. Right. 
And George, so much talk has been about how do we build resilience in young people? How do we do that? This sounds like one of the things you could you can do, right? To to build anything anything else. That... Clearly, you know, um, one one of the kind of it, it's just so helpful to me to understand and and to reference Maslow's hierarchy. I use Maslow hierarchy all the time, right? And most moms and dads take care of the biological stuff. We feed our kid, our kids. Now you move up to the next level and it's both physical and emotional safety. We don't beat our kid, but do they feel emotionally safe or do they feel like a disappointment? Are you always criticizing? Then they're not emotionally safe, work on that. Then the next piece is belonging, their attachment and connection, how they feel being a part of family or being part of a, a friends group. And you know, when we do those two middle pieces, you know what the next piece is? Self-confidence, resiliency. It blooms because they are fed in terms of the safety and this, this connectedness. Kids cannot learn to do tough stuff unless you allow them to do tough stuff. That's interesting that you say that because I've had, so um, after prom, I invited all the kids because I remember growing up that after prom, one of the parents had the kids back. Like we didn't go to diners and, you know, we went back to somebody's house and hung out there. So I invite, I allowed her to invite friends over and it turned out to be 20 kids. So, uh, you know, but <laughs> so they came back, but it was like almost the first time that some of these kids have seen each other in a year. And I really felt like they needed this. So, you know, I ended up doing a waffle station for them. We made 72 waffles and all the toppings, sugared up the kids and sent them home at 1 a.m. I'm, I'm so sorry to the parents, but I saw so much emotion out of these 16 and 17 year old kids. And, you know, like I was happy, I was sad for that. Like I, I just saw so much and I think they really, really needed this. But one of the things that you were saying really hit home for me right now because um, with this whole pandemic and with politics, which I absolutely despise talking about because I just don't feel anything good comes from it um, when there's difference of opinions. But I do have some family members that have really um, kind of looked down at us for getting vaccines or for, you know, and it's, I have to do what's best for my family. And what decision I make should not decide whether or not you love me or don't. Um, and I know that that actually has been huge on Patty, seeing all the changes in the world, the, the hate, the segregating, the, you know, why does this have to be like, and you kind of grow up to believe your family is your inner circle. And it's disappointing when you look and it's your family who doesn't have your back right now, you know? So that's kind of been something that my daughter has been going through. I mean, my husband and I are going through too, but she's kind of trying to find her place with that because she doesn't agree. And I do have some older generation family members that kind of are very old school in the respect. They kind of feel the man is in charge and the woman really has no say. And in, so, today, and in today's generation, that's not a safe way to be. If anything, we're showing now that change needed to happen. And I, I, I kind of live by the philosophy, you know, do you? Like, if you're kind to me, I don't care what color your skin is, what, you know, nationality you are, what, I, I, you're good to me, we're good. So bringing those kids together is a way of, of, of meeting Maslow's expectation of belonging, right? Mm -hmm. Commonality, common sharing, common laughter, great idea, wonderful idea. Thank but you. But the other thing, I'm going to take you back to the penguins, right? You and your husband 
have to huddle around your daughter to protect her from the storm of the family's attitude, right? Okay. That's the protectiveness. Um, so the, the, um, the other thing that I say to parents a lot is when at all possible, limit the exposure to all the toxicity. You don't have to be in, in, in all of it. You, you can give yourself a break. Now with social media, with their access to information, it makes it harder, but you can give her permission that says, you know, you don't have to drink that Kool-Aid all the time. You don't have to eat that negative stuff all the time. Give yourself a break. Give yourself an hour away from your phone or, or away from your computer. So you're doing all the right stuff to keep to create a safe environment for your daughter, Pam. Thank but, you. But what, what I like about what you said too, George, is that it's not about you know, never exposing the kid to this negativity, right? And, and coddling them to the point where, oh, we can't even have you listen to this family member, but you expose them and then say, all right, that's, that's enough. But you right. need it's to know that that's portions. out in the world. Yeah. yeah, there's a portion there. We're gonna, we're gonna set yeah. some boundaries. It's good that you know that this is, is exists in your family and in the world and it's not pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I connected again to coaching where um, my son was at a, a practice and he had a coach on, who was helping, who was really demonstrative and a big yeller and critical. And it was right. like, okay, that wasn't pleasant. We don't want you around that coach all the time. But sometimes you're going to have a boss and a, and a teacher and maybe yeah. a coach who's like that. So how can you manage that person for a period of time and then move on and put yourself around you know, other people? So I, right. I like what you said, George. And Pamela also had a thought when you hosted that party, which I think big kudos for you for doing that. I mean, more <laughs> thank you parents should take that on. What I love about your story is, you know, a lot of people don't work with teenagers, uh, think of teens as like apathetic and uh, this kind of look, like who cares? But in my experience, as soon as you put teenagers around something novel, right. it's like they're a novelty seeking missile. The light turns on, the emotions come out. And it's like, whoa, who's this kid? And what you did there based on, you know, the pandemic was you gave them this novel social experience they hadn't seen in a year or more. Right. And all of a sudden, all these emotions came out. And I think for adults, it is so heartening to see kids, you know, mm -hmm. behaving that way. Cause it's like, wow, there is someone in there. They're, they're coming out. This is great. Right. Right. So. And some of these kids I haven't seen in a long time too, like even longer than a year. So like I, these kids walked in my house and I was like, oh my God, you grew up. Like, it's <laughs> just, you know, it's like, this really happened. You're all growing up. And, you know, I, I, it was just, it, like I said, it was beautiful, but it was, you know, I think the kids are coming to terms with, oh my God, I may not see you guys next year because now we're split into college courses. It's sure. not like they have another year. So, yeah. you know, but my take on that, like my daughter and I talked the day after because they were all so exhausted. And I said, well, here's what you do with that, Patty. You, you meet me once a month. You get a gathering. I said, especially most of you are going to be driving soon. Pick a night once a month and meet at Applebee's or somewhere or come here or whatever you want to do. And, you know, you have to make the effort to get together if you want to keep that friendship uh, as a part of your life. I want to take your suggestion, Pam, and just flip it a bit, right? Okay. Because, because Patty's of an age. Once the once the problem is identified, like you know, I'm just not going to see my my friends as, as easily. Then, the, the, rather than solve the problem for her, ask her mm -hmm. if she has some ideas of how she could solve that problem. See, oh, then okay. she can say, "Well, how about this or how about that?" And then you can say, "What a great idea!" Because now you've lifted her confidence. Okay. She has okay. found this problem solving. She's likely to follow through on her solution. Less likely to follow through on your solution. Okay. So it's just a matter of you play a different role. Right. It is. I, I don't want to say I'm a control freak because I, I'm, I'm really not. <laughs> I swear. But I, um, my job for a living is I'm an event coordinator and have been for 27 years at Rutgers. So like at a very young age, I was given the ball to run with and kind of take control of everything. Sure. And it's not that I want to take control of her life because I don't. I want to see her blossom into this beautiful thing. But I really appreciate that you're telling me like it's, you know, almost validating me that it's OK to take a step back and and let her, you know, come up with healthier. these ideas. 
Moms yes. and dads really do need to take a step back because mm-hmm. if you've done a really good job as they've been growing up, then they've internalized right and wrong values, what you stand for. Now right. they have an opportunity to practice using them. But if you're always there, they never get a chance to practice. That's true. And you'd rather they practice while they're in high school than have to try to figure it out when they're in college. Good point. You know, good I, point. I think too, technology has made it easier for parents to always be there, right? Whereas years ago, Mm -hmm. just the physical separation of, oh, you're out of the house. You can't just pick up a phone and call real easily. Right, right. So you had to do things on your own, whereas now you actually could be that kind of umbilical cord throughout the day, you know, answering questions. And so we have to impose, I think, some structure and actually say, no, no, I think you can handle this on your own. Right. I mean, my parents would be like, be home by dark. And that was it. They didn't know where I was. And, you know, but the flip side to that is, and and maybe it's a mom thing. I don't know, but I'm sure it's a dad thing too. We're in a different world today than we were when we were growing up. Like there wasn't as much hatred and violence that I recall growing up. I mean, I walked to and from school. I, you know, when I got my license, I would go out with my friends. I was home on time because I didn't want to, you know, take advantage of the fact my parents had trusted me. And, you know, um, I get nervous when my daughter leaves the house because it's, you know, it is a very different world and she's a very pretty girl and there's very not nice people out there. But I... I I do slowly take steps like she has some friends that invited her to go to New York to a convention in November. And I was like, okay, you know, you can go. And she was like, what? Like, you know, (laughs) she almost hit the floor that I said she can go. And I'm like, no, I, I have to start trusting. I have to let her go and experience Good for you, Pam. Good for you, Pam. You know, it's because <laughs> if you if you don't make that shift, and that, that's about you, that's not about her, right? That's about right. your fear. Mm-hmm. So we have to be careful not to put our fear on our children. Correct. Right. right. But your work with it is a really good thing to do because it does show her and it will make her more appreciative of being safety in her own surroundings. How does right. she keep herself safe when she's away from home? Right, exactly. Exactly. And I, I, I am, it's easier for me now because she has her solid group of friends and, and they're all protective of one another. And that does make the slowly detachment, you know, letting her go, spread her wings. It makes it a little bit easier. So Good. Good. You know, I think this speaks to COVID and, and the pandemic a bit too, because we haven't fully realized it yet, but kids you know, have been told, no, you got to stay in the house. You can't go out. Right. There is this inherent fear of this invisible virus. And that that's going to come out when, when they start to interact more with people and explore the world. Um, I think you're going to ha- see some kids who are really struggling with right. the, the mm-hmm. change. And, and, and so I'm curious, George, um, maybe if you can speak to that, um, that shift that, and how, how we're going to see perhaps you know, certain behaviors emerge in the next six months to a year. Kids who didn't have anxiety before the pandemic now might start to show it and how that might impact their functioning. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there, there may be some kind of rules of thumb here, but there, there's not really. We haven't yet begun to understand the impact of COVID. That research is going to be coming out for years, both in adults and kids. Um, but there are some trends and there are some things that, that we've already begun to see. Number one. Um, Matt, you and I talked about this. Kids with social anxiety loved being home. They didn't have to go to school and deal with the social anxiety, right? So now that may make the transition back more difficult, but for a while that served them really well. So that's one trend that we see. The other trend that we see is, and and, uh, the other part of my work is, I'm working a lot with teachers and administrators to make sure that they, that come September when, when school actually gets rolling again, that they should spend more time on the social emotional adjustments, not on the curricular start. 
uh, the, what, what the word we use is Maslow before Bloom. Look at Maslow's hierarchy before Bloom's taxonomy, which is about curriculum, because it is going to be a huge social readjustment for kids and for the adults in the school. So allow them to do talking about their experiences. That's powerful. This is what we did during COVID. Let them share their sadnesses. If somebody in the family was, uh, was ill or died, that's an important part of the, what kids have been through. Coping skills, sharing is good. And, and when we get anxious, what are some of the things that we can do even here in the classroom? So you begin to, to, to kind of insulate the kids with a sense of this is new, this is awkward, this is uncomfortable. However, we have to work to make the unfamiliar familiar, to make the uncomfortable comfortable. How do we do that with the adults in school that we trust? So we work with the adults to make sure that they're bridging home pandemic to post-pandemic school. Thank you, George. I appreciate that. Pamela, we have time for maybe one more topic or question. Anything uh, burning that you wanted to bring up? Um, I mean, you touched upon some really good starts for me uh, as far as helping my daughter regain her self-confidence and I think that'll be huge going into this next journey of her life so thank you very much for that um I I have been around parents who think they're perfect I know there's no such thing um I know it, there's always things for kids to learn there's always things for adults to learn so I truly uh appreciate your thoughts um Pam can I ask you a question yeah, absolutely. Well, what was what was the incentive? What what is it about what Matt is offering here that made you take time out of your day to jump on this call? Um, actually, Mr. Orff reached out to me. He's a guidance counselor over at Mercer County Technical School, and throughout Patty's time at uh, the Votech, he, I mean, I've been very involved with helping her with school functions he knows that I'm that type of parent that wants to help the kids. He knows that, you know, when the kids are having a tough time, they're here. You know, when the kids need a parent to talk to, if they can't talk to their parents, they come here. They know they can trust me. But I've also established with them that if it's something serious, I'm going to have to tell your parent. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to hide from their parents. Um, <coughs> I think that Mr. Orff knows me well enough to know that, you know, I just absolutely adore the ground that Patty walks on. He appreciates that I'm the type of parent that cares about it, their kid because he sometimes sees a little less and less of that. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I have a little tickle. Okay, um, well, I'm going to reward you for being on this call. I'm going to send you a copy of my book. Let me grab it here. I'll get your address. And we'll get off. Oh, okay. You're so wonderful to spend time with us. <laughs> uh, here it is. By the way, they're ten dollars a copy, but for you, eight fifty. I'll uh, I'll make change. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I will send this to you uh, and and sign it for your daughter for Patty. Oh my God, that's fantastic. P a t t y. P a t t i. Ah, and here's the reason behind that, just because I like to be unique, because I teach her to be unique. She was born blind in her left eye. And they actually found that in my 20 week ultrasound. So she is in a medical journal. Um, and I wanted to spell her name P A T T I. So she had two good eyes. That's great. That's really great. You know, uh, George, I have one question before we part, and thank you for sharing that, Pamela. You know, I'm curious, and this is coming from me as a parent of two kids, eight and 11 years old. You know, we were relatively quiet in terms of activities during the pandemic, and now I'm noticing this ramping up, and I know in the fall it's going to keep increasing. And I was surprised at the, the tension it was creating in me to all of a sudden have the schedule that seems so busy. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what you suggest for parents who are going to have an adjustment themselves where they went mm -hmm. to a relatively calm period where maybe they could take a nap in an afternoon or read a book or just relax in the backyard. Now it's like we're go, go, go all over again. So right. what do you think? You know, parenting is a real high stress job. 
I mean, you get paid a lot of money for being a mom or dad, but it's a high stress job. <laughs> So therefore, actually. <laughs> so therefore, self-care is critically important, right? Okay. So what you do for you, aside from, from your partner or your kids, is critically important. They, there, are, there are five things on the top chart of what human beings need. Number one is sleep. Sleep has to be regular, and it has to be somewhat in at the same time, up at the same time, um, and it's got to be routine. Second is nutrition. One of the things that we found, well, let me back up a step. During COVID, sleep was blown up in every family. There yep. weren't any sleep schedules. Kids weren't getting sleep. And if you have adolescents and they have devices in their room, sleep is even more disrupted. Mm -hmm. So sleep has got to be sacred and protected. Nutrition, during COVID, it was grab and go. Whatever was easy, pop it and throw it in the oven or whatever. But there weren't a lot of of really prepare, thinking about prepared foods because mom and dad were on their computers doing work from home. Right. A family who eats dinner together, same table, same time, a couple of times a week, they reduce a whole lot of the disruptors in that kid's life later because the family has developed that connectedness. Sleep, nutrition, and exercise are the top three. So moving your body, going for a walk, being outside, being in nature, they are the things that you can do as a mom and dad to manage your own stuff. And then the last thing on that same topic, I would say, Matt, is when, when you feel something in yourself or you're wondering about what your kids is, ask them. Say, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of feeling like I'm getting a little bit, I get this buzz going, this jazz going. Are you guys feeling that as the schedule changes? And then you have a family conversation around it. They'll give you some insight. No, thank you. Thank you very much. That was you know, actually for, really good. For me, I I, uh, I meditated the other day when I just nice. I, I looked at this schedule in the next few days and I'm like all good stuff, but it, I just had this tension in there and I thought, let me sit down. I I have uh, been practicing transcendental meditation for about five years. Um, you know, meditation was number four, Matt. Sleep, nutrition, exercise, meditation, <laughs> health, healthy relationships. There are the five. Thank you. And so good for you. I, I, yeah, and I, I did find it helpful. Just just taking that, that time of myself, closing my eyes, and just feeling everything settle. That's yeah. what meditation does for me. A lot of people think it's like some mysterious thing. I really think it just rests your brain, it feel does, things does. settle, and then you get back with a renewed perspective. Mood is up. Um, so I, I can't promote that enough uh, to people watching, but George, I can't thank you enough for being a part of this. Uh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure. It was a, fun, it was a fun afternoon. Yeah, I mean, your wealth of knowledge, and it is very hard to find a therapist, Pamela. So uh, the fact that we got one on the call yeah, here. Thank you. Is, no, thank you. That's <laughs> awesome. It uh, is just wonderful. And I do hope that if the parents have questions, feel free to, they can email me about anything we talked about in this session. I can even uh, maybe connect with George and see if he has any answers. Uh, you, it's just my name, Matt, at mattbellis.com, the easy email to reach out to. Uh, and thank you so much for being on the call, Pamela, and adding your thank parent you. questions. George, anything thank to add you. before we go? No, it was wonderful because I like the relaxed conversation, right? It's just interested adults sharing ideas and sharing emotions. Perfect. Helps to create healthy families. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I have to say, when I first pulled up and I saw George Scott, like I saw it really quick. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to be talking to George C. Scott. This is amazing. Now, I get I used to get that more when he was alive. I don't get that. Right, as right. Much Not so much when, now. And that I was like, how did that call. happen? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, well, with today's technology, they could have had a holiday. You never know, you know? man. You never know. <laughs> Zoom reaches the far places. Well, that's a good point to end on, Pamela. Thank you so much and thank you for watching and we'll see you the next session if you're following this in order yeah it's gonna, monday week. it's yeah. going to be wednesday oh, at wednesday. one o'clock okay i know that and, uh, <laughs> we have the great christine abrams on talking about a technique called the havening which i'm fairly new to and i'm going to be learning along with everybody else so, i love christine she's a good colleague i like her smart yeah <laughs> terrific thank you so much and uh, we'll see you next